One of my favorite authors is a man named H.B. Phillips. He wrote many books and they are all free on the internet. You can just Google the name of the book and you'll find it on some website because it's in the public domain. This is his book on analytic geometry and calculus. And this is the second edition. Finding the physical books, like finding the actual hardcover copy, is pretty hard, but I know there are some copies out there. I'll try to find some if I can. I'll leave a link in the description, but you can get the book for free. The cool thing about this particular book is that it has answers to all of the problems. So I thought in this video, we would just take a random problem from this book, maybe an integral or something, and I'll show you some math so you can learn some mathematics. Just gotta give it a whiff here. Ah, smells so good. I love these books because they have answers and they're old school. It's like a piece of history. Actually, this one is signed by someone. This person used it in 1953. So in 1953, this person used this book at MIT, which is interesting. MIT is where H.P. Phillips taught. He actually taught there for several years and then he actually became the chair of the math department. So yeah, pretty cool. Let's do some mathematics. Let's quickly look at least at the contents of the book before we do a problem so you can see what it actually contains. Analytic Geometry and Calculus, second edition. We won't spend too much time with it. Just want to show you what it's like. And there's the legend, H.B. Phillips, PhD, LLD. I don't know what that means. I should know, but I don't know what LLD means. Professor of Mathematics, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here are some other books by the legendary H.B. Phillips. Very nice. And here are the copyrights. So the book is free. If you Google it, you will find it for free. Printed in the United States of America, it says. It is the object of this book to present analytic geometry and calculus in the form and order in which these subjects are required for courses in science and engineering. In these courses, calculus is the subject that is most used. After a mere introduction of graphical representation, the book therefore begins with calculus. In fact, the first three chapters provide a complete elementary course in this subject, including integration as a process of summation. He just goes on and talks about what the book contains. And there's a thank you there. And it's signed Cambridge, Massachusetts, February 1946. It's amazing how long ago that was, right? Just like a piece of history. So here's a quick look at the contents. Limits and continuity, that's the first chapter. Derivative and differential, that's chapter two. Let's go quickly here. Integration and summation, that's chapter three. Algebraic equations and graphs, that's chapter four. Determinants, trig functions, exponential and logarithmic functions, parametric equations. Polar coordinates, lots of topics. It's a very, very, very condensed book. So he goes through the topics very quickly. Very, very quickly. The best part about this book is that it's free. Uh, unless you, of course, you want a physical copy, then it might take some work. But again, I'll try to leave a link in the description if I can find any physical copies. And of course, you have answers to the problems, which is awesome. Even the even number problems have answers. Okay, let's go ahead and take a problem and do some mathematics. Here are some of the integration problems. Let's maybe do, how about we try 71? Number 71, the integral of cosine cubed dx divided by the sine of x. Let's go ahead and try to work that out. Okay, so we have the integral of cosine cubed x dx over the sine of x. All right, we have to integrate this. I'm sorry, I just gotta give the book a little smell here because it smells, ah, oh, it smells like an old comic book. As a collector of books and other things, it's just really nice to have that old smell. So whenever you have trig functions like this and integrals, I guess the first thing you should think of, you know, is, is u equals sine x, is that gonna be a valid substitution right away? And right away you see it won't be, but it's a pretty good guess and it might be what we end up doing. The important thing is whenever you have powers of sine and cosine, if you have one of them being raised to an odd power in the numerator, like this in this case here, cosine, what you can do is you can save a copy of cosine. So write it like this, cosine squared x, cosine x, dx over sine x. So again, whenever you have powers of sine and cosine, 
you want to save a copy of the one that's being raised to an odd power. Okay, it's just a really good strategy um, to implement. So, if, for example, if you had sine cubed x, cosine squared x, you would save a copy of sine. Okay, so that's what you would do in that case. And again, we're thinking we're saving a copy of cosine because we're going to let u be our sine. So what you do now is use an identity here. We can write this as parentheses 1 minus sine squared x, cosine x, dx, over sine x. Now, if you didn't know this, if you didn't know this trick about, you know, powers of sine and cosine, save a copy of the one that's being raised to an odd power, that's okay. You could probably still figure it out by messing around with it. In fact, when I took calculus too, that's what I did. I refused to memorize stuff. I was just really stubborn about memorization. And I somehow got through the test. It took me a long time to work out problems like this, but you know, I got an A and life goes on. But if you can memorize that trick, like in this case here, you would write it as sine squared x, cosine squared x, sine x. And then you're gonna let u be cosine and use identities on this. Same idea, right? So here, uh, we save a copy of cosine, we're gonna let u be sine, so we write this in terms of sines. Now let's make that substitution. So u is sine x. And we're gonna take the derivative, so du, the derivative of sine is cosine x, and then don't forget to put the dx. And now we're actually going to make our substitution. So we're gonna replace cosine x dx with the du. So this becomes the integral of 1 minus u squared du, so everything I've circled is the du, right, over u. I guess you can write it like this. Now we can break this up even further, right? You can do 1 over u minus u squared over u. u squared over u is just going to be u du. And I guess we should have equal signs here if we want. And then now we integrate. This is a formula that is familiar perhaps. If not, I'll tell you what it is. This gives you the natural log of the absolute value of u minus, and then here we can use something called the power rule. So basically, you look at the exponent, and as long, this works as long as the exponent is not negative one. If the exponent is negative one, we have this, right? Because one over u is the same thing as this. So if the exponent is negative one, you use this formula. If it's not negative one, you use what's called the power rule. So you add one to the exponent and divide by the result. Then you have your plus c. But we're not quite done, right? Because the original problem had x's, and here we have u's. So you always want to go back to the original variable. So in this case, it's equal to the natural log of the absolute value of, of sine minus, and then sine squared of x over 2. This is shorthand plus c. So this is shorthand, right? Sine squared x, like this, actually means this. Boom. And that's the right answer. Um, no issues. Looks 100% correct. So that's how you do some, some basic integration. If you were doing this one, let's just talk about it for a moment since we're here and I have it written down. Let's say you were doing this one here, this original problem, this one here. So sine cubed x, cosine squared x. You save a copy of sine, and then you're going to let uh, u, be, uh, u be cosine. So you have to turn this into cosines. So sine squared is 1 minus the other one squared. And then you let u be cosine du is negative sine x dx, et cetera. All right, you keep going and it's pretty easy. Multiply by negative one, make the substitution, and, and then you can go from there. But yeah, just a simple integral, just an example of a random problem from, from this book. I mean, this book has so many problems, right? So many problems. And answers, right? So let's check the answer. This is number 71, okay? 71 in chapter uh, 11. So let's, let's go. Oh, there's some writing here. What's this? Huh. Yeah, writing from the 50s, right? So much history. You wonder where these people are now. You know, are they still alive? How, you know, what, what, what were they thinking at the time? Did they get an A in the class? Um, you know, do they know I'm looking at their book? It's just really, it's really a weird thing. And I believe it was 71. Yeah, here it is. Here's the answer. They just didn't put the absolute value, so... There it is there, ln sine x minus 1 half sine squared x plus c. So really cool, right? You've got 
all the answers to every single problem in this book. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, awesome book. Maybe I'll do some more problems in future videos. Just kind of fun to do random stuff from really cool books. I just got to give it another whiff here. Oh, smells so good. Just an amazing, amazing book. H.P. Phillips, A Living Legend. So I just want to finish by saying, if you're not a subscriber, consider being a subscriber by hitting the subscribe button today. If you're supporting me on Patreon or you're a member of the channel, thank you very much. Just want to say thank you. Also, if you want to learn mathematics, check out my courses. I do have courses, and I have lowered the price to the bare minimum. Just use my website, uh, mathsorcerer.com, and you can get courses there. I have a bunch of calculus courses and algebra courses and a couple more advanced stuff. Anyways, until next time, good luck. Keep doing mathematics.